Comrades, you are all aware of the purpose of our gathering here today. Um, and before we can start this meeting uh, and start the proceedings, I would like you to please be upstanding for one minute as a mark of respect to Fidel Castro was one of the iconic figures of the second part of the 20th century, and of course, the first few years of the 21st century. He was truly great, and I find it essential in this context to actually define what the role of great persons is. A great Marxist, um, Russian Marxist who laid the foundations of Russian Marxism, Georgi Pilokhanov had this to say on the subject um, in his very well-known pamphlet, The Role of Individual in History. He said, great man is great, not because his personal qualities give individual features to the great historical events, but because he possesses qualities which make him most capable of serving the great social needs of his time, needs which arose as a result of general and particular causes. Mm -hmm. Fidel Castro became so important because he became the most representative spokesman of his people in Cuba. And as history moved on, he became a representative spokesman of the masses, millions of masses throughout Latin America. And his reputation, of course, went beyond the tiny island of Cuba and beyond Latin America as well. Um, because of what Cuba did under his guidance and leadership, Castro became a world figure. He was extremely courageous, but that's not the only thing about him. But his courage can be seen from the fact that when they started their movement against the Batista regime in Cuba, just over 100 people hire taxis like you will hire Uber, and they arrive at the citadel of Batista's army in Santiago de Cuba, and they attack it with a view to capturing it and, and unseating uh, um, Batista. It was obviously an unrealistic idea. Most of them were killed, and the rest were captured, among them Fidel. He served a couple of years in jail, and then through pressure of the masses, he was released in an um, amnesty. What does he do? He leaves Cuba and goes to Mexico. And in Mexico, he occupies the house, which at one time had been lived in by the great Mexican revolutionary, Emilio Zapata. And there they plan a revolution. And you know, looking at them, a lot of cynical people around would have been saying, oh, well, it's a kind of reproduction of the life of Brian, isn't it? You know, how can they make a revolution? Less than 100 people hire a rickety boat called Grandma. Grandma has become world famous because since the Cuban Revolution, they gave that name to the newspaper of the Communist Party of Cuba. They landed on the shores of Cuba, and Batista's soldiers were waiting there. Apart from a mere 12, they were all killed. Castro, his younger brother Raul, I hate saying younger brother Raul because a lot of people think it's a dynastic thing. You know, he, he, he passes on the leadership to Raul. Raul is a person in his own right and he spent all his life in revolutionary activities. <laughs> and the Argentinian doctor, Che Guevara, uh, his real name was Ernesto, but all the Argentinians say Che, like we Punjabi say Pai Saab, right? So he became Che. He's known all over the world as Che, but he was Ernesto G G G Guevara. And they go to the mountains of Sierra Maestra to organize the revolution. And by their propaganda, supported by the working class in the towns, Santiago de Cuba, Havana, and various other places, and the peasantry in the countryside, within less than three years, they're able to march triumphantly as Batista leaves on New Year's Eve, 1950, uh, 1959, if you like, uh, 
the uh, Castro and his guerrillas march, march into Havana. Of course, at that time, Castro was not a communist. He was not a socialist. He was a fiercely anti-imperialist, nationalist revolutionary. And because they genuinely meant, unlike the fake nationalists that you find all over the place, they really meant to do something for their people. So what they do is they took over the landed property from the landlords and they nationalized all foreign owned property. And foreign owned in that case only meant American. Now that of course did not endear them to the United States of America. United States of America does not like nationalizations anywhere. So they earned the enmity of the United States. And as the United States became more and more hostile, then the Cuban revolutionaries got closer to the Soviet Union. And that relationship was to last until the collapse of the Soviet Union. And be it said in the honor of the Cubans that they always say that their revolution was an extension of the October Revolution of 1917 in Russia, and that they would <laughs> and that their revolution would not have survived had it not been supported by, by, by the Soviet Union. I think it's a sign of their greatness rather than in any way constituting a diminution in their stature that they actually recognize the debt of gratitude that they, that they owe to the, to the Soviet Union, both as an example and as a source of material support uh, to, 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 to the Cubans. And for a small country like Cuba, its present day population is about 10 million. It was far less at, at that time. For a country to survive that 90 miles away from this monster called US imperialism is no small achievement in itself. Had they done nothing but survived, that would be an achievement. But Cuba did more than that. And that was actually one of the reasons for the hostility of the United States of America towards Cuba. And that is that they served as a contagious example to the rest of Latin America. If the Cubans can do it, then other people can do it too. So the Americans were determined to stop this infection from spreading. They couldn't stop that completely, but nevertheless, they did their, they did their best. But Cuba didn't stop there. Cuba by defending itself, proved in the words of Castro that no weapons, no force is capable of defeating a people who've decided to fight for their rights. And this was an example that Castro's Cuba set to other Latin Americans. And as Castro was dying, there are a number of Latin American countries which have progressive regimes. They're not socialist regimes, but they're progressive. Venezuela is one, Ecuador is another one, Bolivia is another one, and there are examples here, there, and, and, and everywhere. But as soon as Castro's government had come to power, Cuba was a country with mass illiteracy. 54% of the population was illiterate. There was no health care. Cuba was run by gangsters, by brothel keepers and by multinational corporations from the, from the US. So the first thing they do is clean up Havana. They stop it being a prostitution center. And the very first thing that the Cuban revolutionaries do is they round up the 500 chief criminals of the Batista regime, give them a very short summary trial and find them guilty and execute them. Outside Havana's presidential palace, hundreds of thousands rally at the call of revolutionary leader Fidel Castro, who estimated their number at a million. Most of the throng wears the colors of Castro's 26th of July movement. They are in an exultant mood as the man who overthrew the Batista dictatorship calls on them to approve the public trials and executions of pro-Batista figures guilty of war crimes and atrocities. The executions, some 250 to date, have been widely criticized by many as too hasty and summary, even if justified. Says Castro, the Cuban revolutionary government has no reason to offer explanations to America or to anyone except the people of Cuba. Castro asks his audience if it favors the summary court-martial. He gets his answer in a roar of approval. Cuba. 
Cuba has spoken. Despite outside protests, the executions will continue. Now, this is, this is not a violation of human rights. On the contrary, it's the first affirmation of the human rights of the millions of Cuban people who had suffered at the hands of these people. Americans are always ready to defend the human rights of gangsters, brothel keepers, of exploiters, of murderers. You know, any Russian who's stolen a lot of money has suddenly becomes the object of sympathy of various NGOs and human rights, like Khodorovsky from, 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 from Russia. They tell you that his human rights have been denied. And this, this gangster has stolen, had stolen $10 billion uh, um, do, do, from Russian people. And he was deprived of most of that because he committed all kinds of fraud, frauds. The Cubans introduced health system, which is the envy of the world. Whereas the Americans send bombers and drones to kill people, Cubans send, doc send doctors to cure people of ill health. Their education system is the envy of the world. Their education system for ordinary people is better than is in the richest country in the world, that is the United States. In the United States, there are tens of millions of people who have no health cover despite the Obamacare. Cubans have health care for everybody. In Cuba, you do not get to be neglected just because you are unhealthy. You do not always have to go to a doctor. The doctor comes to your area, actually visits you to make sure that you don't get ill. The best way of actually providing health is to be involved in preventing people from getting ill. Not wait till they're ill and then feed the pharmaceutical companies so that they can sell their expen expen expensive drugs. For the first time, black people who'd been brought there as slaves and suffered for centuries in, in, in Cuba, as indeed in the re rest of the New World, Cubans gave equal rights to black people. That's why you find, sometimes you find at our meet, meeting, sometimes the ambassadors, sometimes the next to the ambassador, they're people of black skin. For the first time, black people got dignity to act as equals in that particular, particular society. And Castro always insisted that Cuba was not only Latin American, Cuba was not only European, Cuba was also African. He carries with him a meaning, a signification, which is of tremendous importance to people like ourselves who are the marginalized of the world. And Africa, as a mother country, to so many Cubans, needed to be addressed as part and parcel of the worldwide thing of African liberation. Right from the beginning, Cuba's revolutionary ideals not only spread throughout Latin America, but also forged strong ties with national liberation leaders, such as Secu Touré, Amilcar Cabral, Julius Nyerere, Samora Machel, and Agostino Neto. And it was precisely in that context when the South African fascists of the apartheid regime in, in South Africa which was supported by the free democracies of the world, i.e. United States, Britain, France, Germany, etc. When they were trying to prevent the MPLA government from uh, establishing itself as the government in, 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 in Angola, in 1975, Cuba sent tens of thousands of soldiers to help them establish themselves. La invasión de Angola por tropas regulares de África del Sur no podíamos cruzarnos de brazos. Y cuando el MPLA solicitó nuestra ayuda, le ofrecimos la ayuda necesaria. In 1975, as Angola moved towards independence from Portugal, the CIA, along with the apartheid government of South Africa, tried to bring down the new Angolan government. At the request of the Angolan president, Fidel sent 36,000 troops to keep the South African forces from attacking Luanda, the capital. For many Cubans, whose ancestors were African slaves, the fight in Angola was a way to repair a debt to history. You are the regiment, right? How long do you take here? 
No, yo poco tiempo. ¿Poco tiempo? ¿Tú de dónde eres? Santiago. ¿Qué Santiago. Me veo mucho Santiaguero aquí, pero ahí dentro ya no es Santiaguero. ¿Y tú de dónde? Sigo de Ávila. Sigo de Ávila. In 14 years of war, over 300,000 Cubans, doctors, teachers and engineers, as well as soldiers, played an important role in Angola. More than 2,000 lost their lives. Again in 1987, when the South Africans were sporting a counter-revolutionary in, in Angola called uh, Jonas Subimbi with his UNITA movement, and um, they were trying to overrun the government in Luanda, the Cubans sent upwards of 30,000 troops. I think it was more like 50,000. And in doing so, they risked their own very existence to denude Cuba of these experienced, trained, and hardened fighters, 50,000 of them, to denude Cuba of them and send them thousands of miles away to help a fraternal people who were being savaged by South African apartheid was no small thing. The defeat of the South African army drove a large nail into the coffin of apartheid and helped advance the struggle of the South African people. Una derrota en aquellas condiciones hubiera podido significar el fin de la revolución cubana. Y todo eso ocurrió después del 75. Pero hay que reunir todo el material y eso. Pero nosotros no hemos escrito ni siquiera la historia de la revolución cubana. It, they took a great risk. And it is precisely for that reason that South African apartheid from that time onwards, on the retreat, after the Battle of Quito Conavali, where the South African fascists and their puppets, uh, and of course backed by imperialism, were routed, that South Africa retreated. It led eventually not only to the um, strengthening of the government in Luanda, but also to the end of apartheid in Namibia, end of South African rule in Namibia. and eventually in South Africa itself. It's precisely for that reason, be it said in his honor, that when Mandela got out of prison, he visited various countries to thank them for the help they had rendered. He went to Libya, and the Americans believed, why are you going to Libya? Dictator Gaddafi and whatnot. He said, at a time when you were calling me terrorists, Brother Gaddafi was supporting us and we have every right to see whoever we want to. He goes to Cuba, embraces Castro. Now that's like a red rag to the bull. The Americans didn't like you know, embracing Castro. He's a brutal dictator, you know, he's nationalized American property, and et cetera, how, how, how can you go there? And uh, as Ranjit was telling, telling earlier, he saw some film, and the first thing that uh, Mandela says on meet, meeting Castro is, when are you going to come to South Africa? So Castro tried to have some other conversation, but Mandela would continue to insist, when are you going to come to South Africa? My president. My brother. My brother. How are you? My brother. Please. Please. Very nice to see you. Please sit down. Please sit down. Please sit down. Now, one thing before we say anything. Una cosa antes de hablar, nada, nada. Before we say anything. Antes de hablar absolutamente de cualquier tema. You must tell me when you are coming to South Africa. Me tiene que decir cuándo viene para Sudáfrica. Lo yo sé, no, 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 and our friend Cuba, y nuestro amigo Cuba, which helped us in training our people, que nos ayudó a entrenar a nuestra gente, gave us resources to get on with our struggle, que nos ayudaron tanto nuestra trained gente, our people que as doctors and so on. A nuestros médicos. You have not come to our country. Cuba no ha venido a visitarnos. Usted no ha ido a visitarnos. When are you coming? ¿Cuándo viene? No he visitado a mi patria surafricana. I haven't visited my South African homeland. La quiero como una patria. I want it, I love it as quiero a homeland. 
y para el pueblo. I love Brasil, homeland as I love you and the South African people. Pero cuando viene a South Africa? Creo que va a tener que ser hoy mismo. I think it will have to be today. I will have to fly back with you. No, you are very, very, very. You are leaving a chance, and we are catching the plane together. Soon afterwards, Fidel did go to South Africa and on his way stop off in Namibia, where he was greeted by Sam Nijoma, the nation's leader. Welcome to the Republic of Namibia. The country which you helped to liberate, be liberated. So there were deep bonds of fraternal solidarity between the people of Cuba and the people of Africa generally, but Southern Africa in particular. Castro had terrific ability to think on his own feet and very quickly. In 1960, the Cuban delegation went to attend the United Nations General Assembly. Out of just sheer spite, President Eisenhower got them chucked out of the, a Manhattan hotel called, called the Shelburne. So what did Castro do? They went to Harlem. Harlem has become very fashionable now. It's like Brixton. In my youth, Brixton was a rundown area, and, and you didn't go there unless you were uh, uh, Afro-Caribbean or something like that. Now, every white kid wants to go there. There are gigs, there are cafes, there are all sorts of things. Harlem has become also an upward uh, mobile, mobile place, but not at that time. So Castro goes and books for his delegation, a place in a hotel called Teresa Hotel, to the rapturous applause of Afro-American pe people there. So he turned the, the table down, the Eisenhower administration. But that didn't go down very well either. <laughs> so Eisenhower's successor, Kennedy, you know, he's, he, he was the master of the spin. He's known as a great liberal, great fighter for democracy. But he, he was a total dastardly char char character. You know, he organized counter-revolutionaries who'd run from Cuba. They'd run from Cuba because they were old exploiters or gangsters or brothel keepers or whatever they were. They live in Miami, and uh, uh, they're a dying race because their children are not as bad as their parents were, and their grandchildren certainly. You know, they just become ordinary Americans. Uh, they, they don't think of going, going, going to Havana as... as, as uh, returning to a free, free Cuba of, 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 of the kind, kind they think. So he organized an invasion of Cuba, the Bay of Pigs, Pigs invasion. But this time, Castro and his comrades were waiting for them. And they were picked up very quickly. They were defeated within three days. Mm -hmm. And a few got killed. But most of them were kept. And eventually, they were exchanged. Each one of these prisoners was exchanged for some hugely expensive agricultural machinery which Cuba, Cuba needed <laughs> need, need at the time. Now, I think instead of wasting money on bullets to kill them, it was better to get tractors and machinery and say, now you go back, next time you come, we'll ask for more. <laughs> Mandela once said, what country has ever needed help from Cuba and not received it. And he went on to answer his own question, not one. Cuba was willing to give help wherever it was possible for a country as little as Cuba, for a country as poor as Cuba, for a country subjected to over five decades of a most draconian economic blockade and military threat. And will you believe it, these Democrats, it's the only way they can answer Cuba Cuba's political stance. They organized more than 600 assassination attempts on, on, on Castro. And they say it openly. They're not even ashamed of the fact that they actually try to ass assassinate leaders of, of other countries. And that's what they do. That's how they assassinated Gaddafi. That's how they assassinated, um, um, the, through the Portuguese, the leader of Guinea, 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 Guinea Bissau, Amilcar Cabral, and countless other Africans and other people have been bumped off through assassination attempts. Mm -hmm. And Obama is supposed to have brought liberation to America. People had a lot of hopes on him. They say, here is a black person. You know, he'd make a lot of difference because there's going to be a press. For the first time in the 230-year or 20-year history of the United States, 
I mean, this was Obama's achievement that he took the notice which said outside the White House, whites only, he took that notice out. So that is certainly an achie achievement. But other than that, he's done nothing. He's, he gets up in the morning and looks at papers and signs assassination orders. You know, his drones will go and who is to be killed today? In Africa, in Yemen, in, in, in Syria, or wherever it, it may be. And his parting shot is as he's leaving his office, he has now removed the restriction on the supply of weapons to various so-called liberation fighters abroad. They've lost the game in, in Aleppo, they've lost the game in Syria mainly, and they're still trying to, to hang on to it. And as we speak today, his defense secretary has said, announced that they're going to send 200 more American soldiers to help the Syrians recover Raqqa from the jihadis, the very jihadis they've created. The only fighting force apart from the Syrian Arab army in Syria are the jihadis. So if you want to overthrow the Syrian government, you have to have the help of jihadis. And that's why the Americans, the French, notwithstanding the fact there have been attacks in France and hundreds of French people have been killed, these people shamelessly continue to support, support the jihadis. So they want to have control over Raqqa because if they are in control of some Syrian territory, there is some reason to bargain with the Syrian government and with the Russians as to what should ha happen in Syria. And that's really what they're doing. And Castro, notwithstanding the dangers to Cuba, never in the United Nations did the Cuban delegation ever once vote the wrong way. Whatever the dangers to them, whatever the cost to them, they vote the wrong way. And I think this is a lesson to countries that are powerful and sometimes for various reasons, vote the wrong way. Like on the question of Libya, and there was a no-fly zone. It could not have been established if some of the members of, uh, of, of the Security Council actually had voted the correct way. And it's a matter of great regret to me that South Africa did exactly vote the wrong way. And South Africa owed a lot. Had Mandela had something to do with it, it would not, would not have happened in my view. Whatever your Views, views on Mandela. So, so with these comrade, uh, words, comrades, I start this meeting and our first speaker tonight is the young Catherine Kramer.